power with Priscilla. And we are the people and we have the power. And today I have um, the pleasure of having a couple of guests call in this morning that um, work with the school department. So I believe the first, pr I believe, Sharon, are you there? Yes, ma'am. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? How are you? Uh, I'm Brother Charles we say I'm black -nificent. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I was, um, you overwhelmed me so much when I talked to you the other day. I felt like you needed to call in and give us some information about what is going on with the school department. I'm telling you, it's awful. Um, so I'm looking at the ban and it says that the union sues to block in-person learning. Um, well, the union, yeah, the mm -hmm. union, two of the guests that you're going to have one mm -hmm. this morning, um, Roxy, Roxanne Harvey, who is the, the head, she's mm -hmm. the head person in SPEDPAC, okay. which is a special education parents advisory council. Mm -hmm. Um, she's the new head of that. And uh, Ruby Reyes, who is the executive director of Boston Education Justice Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, we are all on the ground <clears throat> in different areas of education. Mm -hmm. And so this morning, you know, the banner is a weekly newspaper. So this morning, there is a press release and there's going to be um, a roundtable, what they call equity roundtables, with the Boston Teachers Union and the school department later today because the judge actually blocked the Boston Teachers Union from being in court. So the BTU and BPS are in court right now mm. um, because the infection rate went over 4%. Right. And the Boston Teachers Union had fi had um, signed and agreed to a memorandum of agreement with the mayor and the Boston Public School Department that if the rates, infection rates, COVID infection rates went over 4%, the schools would go totally remote. Mm-hmm. Um, there is an issue because the school department is saying no, there are students who are high needs, and, and that includes special education, mm -hmm. you know, students with learning disabilities and English language learners and homeless students. I mean, there's, there's a, a definition of what high needs is, and they had already gone, half of them had already gone back to school last week. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's research that says these young people have regressed. As mm -hmm. much as a year to a year and a half of their learning. Wow. And so they went back to school for a week. It was supposed to be half one week and then half this week. Mm -hmm. But the infection rate went up to 4.1% last week. The mayor and the superintendent decided they were going to shut the schools down. They did that. But then they had this mixed message, which has been happening since March. Well, but because we have these students that, that are high need students, those students will continue to go in, and those teachers need to continue to go in. And so the Boston Teachers Union is saying, oh, no, that's not the deal. These teachers should have the option of doing remote or going in. Mm -hmm. And because they want to be safe, none of them should have to go in. So there is a battle going on, mm -hmm. um, and, and parents are being pit against teachers, are being pit against the union, being pit against the superintendent and the mayor. The kids are in the middle, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's it's... It should be simple. It's like everybody supposedly is there for the kids and for our students, but that's not what's happening. Wow. So, Sharon, you you are the founder of Black Teachers Matter, right? Black Teachers Matter Incorporated, yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm an educator and a parent. And, you right. know, I've been out there on the, on the front lines with you when we yeah. couldn't get anybody else out there. You <laughs> had your bullhorn and Brother Lowe was out there. <laughs> Just like the postman, man, rain, sleet, snow, shine, <laughs> whether it is a crowd or with a crowd of you and Jesus. You know, we go out there and we fight for what we believe in. Right. And so my kids, when I was fighting against the charter school, my kids stood with me and the parents stood with me. And that was um, 2014. Mm -hmm. And I officially made Black Teachers Matter a 501c3 this year when I saw... Um, a couple of my kids at the commencement caravan that we pulled together, we organized, BG was there too, we organized a celebration of all of the graduating seniors of 2020 because of the COVID, nobody right. was having graduation ceremonies, including my daughter, who's a graduating senior in college. And so we organized so many organizations, went through seven different neighborhoods in Boston, and two of my kids... Um, and your mom showed up at the commencement caravan, and I looked at the banner, 
Mm-hmm. Black Teachers Matter, and I looked at him, mm-hmm. and I said, you all are the reason why I started this. And then I formalized, I took my, I took my COVID stimulus money, mm-hmm. and I opened up and made it an official uh, 501c3. I hear you, I hear I believe one of our guests is on. Um, I don't know if it's Ruby or Roxanne. It's Ruby, good morning. Hi, Ruby, Yay. good morning. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I just want to say, Priscilla, I told um, Sharon that I voted for you when you <laughs> ran for city council. And I was just thinking this morning, I was like, how often do you get to vote for someone that you actually want to vote for? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank I you. Thinking, I don't really want to vote for Joe Biden, but I mean, it's not like I have an option, you know? I know, but so, you know, this with this ranked choice vote and it may, you know, may ch- switch up some things. <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to share that because, you know, I've never been, I... I'm a regular voter, I'm an informed voter, and I, I've never been more proud to vote for someone. Well, and thank so you. I hope you run again, and I will vote for you again if you do. So I just wanted to let you know that that was the first time I was happy to, to cast a vote. So. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. I really do. Because it was, I'll tell you, it was a tough battle there, <laughs> but yeah. it's all good. You know, it's all good. I guess I'm where I'm supposed to be, you know. We all yeah. can't be politicians, and I'm telling you, looking at some of these ones that we have now, I don't know if I want to, we even want to be a, considered a politician, but I always said that I'm an activist, I, you know, I'm an a- activist and I'm an advocate, and I will be that until the day I die, whether I'm in an elected office or whether I'm, con- you know, working with BG or Boston Praise Radio or the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition. I just want to help my folks and just, you know, see us rise above all this madness that is going on. So yeah. um, I appreciate you. And so you um, you work with Beja. I know we I work, work with, with Beja. Yeah. <laughs> we work with them on the vote no on two for the child of schools when uh, Marlena was the um, was was the coordinator. Yeah. So, so I'm the very first um, executive director of Beja's. You know, it's seven years young, okay. so we're we're growing. We're we're trying to, you know, do some things. We uh, bring parents, students, and teachers together to mm-hmm. do advocacy um, for a better Boston public schools. So I'm happy to serve um, as the director, its first director, uh, for three years now. So okay, I'm very well, grateful. Congratulations! So. I, I hear that there's a, a war, almost a war going on with the <laughs> with the school department and the unions about this you know this learning. You would think that with everything with the with everything spiking up, and they've already said that it was going to spike up in the fall. So you would have thought that what did the school department? I mean, what were they doing all summer? What what, what was their plan? Did they not have one? Obviously I mean, not. I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's the real the real question is. You know, like, what were they doing? They've had seven months to prepare, Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, rather than, you know, when you have a task to do, you look at the big stuff first, and you get that done first, right? Mm -hmm. And I think they didn't do that. So they could have easily planned for, you know, the approximate, there's 11,000, there's 12,000 now special ed students um, that have IEPs, and not all of them are in need of, in-person services, um, they get IEPs for different things, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the range is huge. So some children just need door-to-door bus service. Um, other children need, like, individual reading specialist time. So each one is different, but not all of them are high needs. Right. So if you take that number and you say approximately, like, 5,000 of them will need in-person services that are very specialized and you know, need, need those specific services. And it's not even necessarily, you know, that they need in-person services all day. Mm-hmm. It could be in-person services with a reading specialist. It could be like, this child's doing well in math. They don't need those in-person services. They just need them for, you know, English language learners, or they need physical therapy, mm-hmm. right? But there was never a moment in time where, you know, they said, okay, we have about Five to 6,000 students that are going to need these in-person services. Let's figure out how to do that first. Make mm-hmm. sure that those children have the in-person services that they need, and then let's figure out the rest. So you have your highest need students that need these specialized services, and they're not receiving them mm-hmm. for seven months now, since March. Wow. And I think that's, that's the real crux of the situation is, 
you know, all this stuff is going back and forth, and, you know, special ed parents are being pitted against the union, and, mm-hmm. but I mean, the reality is, like, the Boston, you know, the Boston Central Office, Mm-hmm. Um, BPS's central office is responsible for coming up with a comprehensive plan that keeps teachers safe, that keeps students safe, and they haven't done that. Wow. They provided us with the first plan in July, which was actually the worst plan out of the whole entire state. Other other cities are doing it well. Well, Kurt, um, I don't want to so, cut you off, but who is part of the plan and who is at the table? Uh, any parents at the table? No, this is all um, central office staff. So you have you have a, a separation between like your superintendent, your your you know school superintendents that are responsible for different schools. You have um, your director of special education um, and kind of all these like upper administrative folks. So you and don't have, have any your, like down to earth parents or right real teachers. Sharon, what do you think about that? <clears throat> well, you know, Ruby is like one of the warrior queens that's on the ground. Mm-hmm. And when Roxy gets on here, you're going to hear the fire from Queen Ruby, too. Um, I think that, I mean, I agree. And Ruby and I have been in so many different zooms and rooms as, as recently as last night. Mm-hmm. Um, where there are all these different siloed groups that are making decisions on different aspects. And people are looking at different pieces of the elephant. And I don't know who's, well, ultimately it falls on Mayor Marty Walsh because he's the one that hired the superintendent. He's the one that appointed everybody into an appointed school committee. And Boston's the only school committee that's appointed, not elected. Right. And then you've got certain advocacy groups for parents, but to get them all together and to listen to everybody else, everybody else is saying, oh, yeah, we've got parents here, we've got, and we're speaking for blah, 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 oh, but what about the young people? And so the young people have had forums. Julie Mejia has had separate forums. Elected officials have elected forums. Everybody says that they're speaking for people. And Ruby and I have been in rooms of people um, 500 and 600 and 700 up. Mm. And so for seven months, for the people who are getting paid all these big bucks to not have it together, when school was closed mm. and scrambling now is that they're at like they know what they're doing and they're pulling it out of their behind, reacting to situations when it's like you knew that these buildings were not, um, the buildings sucked before COVID. Exactly. That's what I said. They're a mess. They don't clean them schools. Please. I have reports. I'm listening to teachers and parents, you know, talk about the condition of the building. I remember teaching in the buildings. They couldn't keep paper towels and soap Mm, mm, mm. and toilet tissue in the bathroom. I'm supposed to expect that they know what the heck is going on. I was in a classroom teaching every grade, and the windows barely opened then. And wow. so now we're hearing reports that teachers are going into buildings and they're cold, they're freezing. Um, and so today, you know, the BTU is asking when the teachers go into the building to actually use their phones and put on social media the conditions of their rooms and put it out on blast. Mm. So there's a war. Our kids are losing, but our kids, especially black and brown kids, have been losing in the Boston public school system forever. forever. Exactly. And what about this the five thousand? What about the five thousand homeless children? What, how are they being educated? They're supposed exactly. to be the high needs, including in the high needs, and that's always been a problem. And, and Ruby and Max, as I have watched, you know, I like them, but I don't like what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. The herd is signed, you know, a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education three days before all the schools were shut down, basically putting the whole Boston uh, public school system in danger of being put into receivership and taken over by the state. I mean, it's like, come on, man, you just got here from Minnesota. What the hell do you really know wow. about the culture of this? And Minnesota's no joke either. Mm. But what do you really know about Boston? Mm-hmm. What do you really know about busting? What do you really know about the parents and the students? Um, right. fighting for this forever in this city. And so she's working for the mayor. So she wants to keep her job. Right. And Marty wants to keep his job. Mm. And the school department, I mean, uh, Ruben and I were laughing about, you know, the, the, the chair of the school committee rolling his eyes when people are bringing up, you know, on these big, huge forms of the school committee meeting, giving things about inequity and racism in the system and, and inequality.
quality and he's rolling his eyes. So it's like, come on, man. You know, the thing about it is they definitely need to go back to an elected school committee. And I know, I believe that the NAACP uh, and Tanisha Sullivan are, are working on that. That was one of the things when she first became NAACP president, she said she was going to work on to ensure that Boston Public Schools got an appointed, went back to an appoint, uh, elected school committee. And we definitely, that's what we need because a lot of, some of the folks that are on the school committee don't even have children in Boston Public Schools. Some don't have children. I mean, you need parents, you need nurses, you need teachers. To be part of the of the, the 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 school committee because this this is these are the people people that are on the ground that see what's going on. You you hire you you hire all these high high class folks pay all this money and what do you get? A mess. Well, you know, a lot of the folks. Go ahead, go ahead, Ruby. Well, I was saying that a lot of the folks in central office, you know, they haven't been in the classroom for years. Right. Like, mm. Right. And so, you know, that reality um, is, is huge. Like, you, you, before, teachers kind of moved up. They went from the classroom to, like, administration, and so they had that perspective. But now you have this kind of, like, these, you know, degree-ridden folks that move into these positions without actually having the concrete, like, 10-year teacher experience. And that's why you have this lack of, you know, decision making based on the reality of what happens in a classroom. Right. right. And then you have a large population of students who are black and brown, who are people from, you know, our neighborhoods in the Boston area, is, with the exemption of the exam schools. That's another hole. That's another hole. That's another story. Uh, well, radio and that's it's a, it's that's for another radio. day. I'll keep, it, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it clean. But. You know, so you have, um, to, to your point about Tanisha, um, Tanisha Sullivan, uh, Mike, uh, um, Matt Krieger, um, ACLU, the, the um, Lawyers for Civil Rights, there are groups that are involved, Boston Equity, um, Beja, um, Black Teachers Matter, there are groups that are involved in that happening, and there's a recent sort of a victory, and I say sort of. Mm -hmm. The whole issue of the exam schools was brought forward, and you know, so we talk about the inside out, I mm -hmm. brought forward to stop the exams for this year um, because of COVID. So there is a vote that's going to be happening on the 21st at the school committee, and we're encouraging everybody to show up. You have to register by 4 o'clock, 4.30 to be on this humongous Zoom um, that goes way into the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and then they vote, and they will vote on whether or not that those exams will get stopped. So... In the HCP and the Education Committee and a coalition of folks have actually pushed that forward with this group. You know, Ruby and I were talking about these groups that come together and and get to the policymakers, get to the decision makers to mm -hmm. even consider doing the right thing. And then there's this, um, for those people who have been, I mean, I can't really stomach it, but for those people who have been watching these Senate confirmation hearings with this chick, Amy, mm -hmm. Amy, and I'm, I'm going to call her Karen, Amy, Coney Barrett, who the GOP is trying to force through, mm -hmm. when you look at this, this one particular guy, White House, put together this 10-minute piece about where the money is in politics mm -hmm. and how the people with the money are making the decisions. So we can say that we should have an elected school committee, but you and I both know that it really comes down to who gets out there, mm -hmm. whose face gets out there, who gets, you know, in COVID, you can't go door to door. So advertising money, social media money, that costs money. And if you don't have that, you may be the best candidate. And then someone, and we, we know people, personally we know people who got money from charter schools or who got my, money from, you know, big pocket people and unseated people who were very good people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and or either kept them out of office or pushed them out of office. And we've seen that in Boston. Mm -hmm. So we know, you know, the so the discussion is all appointed. Um, all elected or a hybrid, and then what does the hybrid look like? And so there have been groups that have actually put proposals forward in terms of what a hybrid should look like, and then who should select those particular, you know, people that would, whether they, whether there's a guaranteed position for a, a teacher, a guaranteed position of the school committee for a parent, a guaranteed mm -hmm. position for a student. The student, right. Boston Student Advisory Committee has been pushing for an elected position 
on the city council and the school committee for years. Right, so I remember a hearing right. where they, you know, they said, you know, should the students have a voting rights? Right. Yes, they should have voting rights. You're going to have them sitting there in the meetings and they don't have nothing. They can't say anything. They can't vote. Come on. Right. Yeah. right. And then that, that goes down to the parents, too. Um, mm-hmm. And Ruby's organization has been doing, uh, Beige has been doing an excellent job of, of trying to translate in the meetings, in the announcements before the meetings, get these parents. I don't think most people realize the large percentage of people that don't speak English and mm. parents who don't speak English. And so even if you have these formats, if they don't understand what you're saying, how can they knowledgeably participate or vote either? Exactly. That's true. And, and you know, there should always be tra- some type of translation. I know on some of the Zoom calls I've been on, you know, they have people who actually, you know, translate in different languages and stuff, you know. I mean, it seems like we have, we are uh, in the world of Zoom and Zoom and Zoomers and Zoomites and um, <laughs> for, 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 <laughs> for the next, we don't know how many months, this is how it's going to be. But, you know, our children should come first. Their safety should come first, and their education should come first. The school department has a one-point-something billion-dollar budget, okay? So a lot of the, the, the money that they that they normally would use, they're not using because I, I, the kids aren't in school. Why can't they just make a, 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 a decision on what to do? It makes sense to have the special needs kids in school. And it, and then and while the ones that are that are not special needs, why can't they be at home um, learning? Because it's really it's 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 a, it's a lot, and we have over fifty something thousand um, BPS students. So we're looking at a lot of families, you know, children who are being again miseducated. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, I think what's, what's particularly sad about it is just, um, you know, that that they are being completely left out of the conversation. Mm. So just like these very, the, the decisions that have been made up until this point have just lacked a lot of common sense. Mm. So you know that it's going to get cold in the spring. You know that it's getting cold now. Ugh, yes. So the whole ventilation system plan is based on opening a window mm. opening right. one window wow so it's just you know like the level of common sense i think in leadership is just severely lacking or severely uncaring um and so it's short-sighted it's short-sighted it's short-sighted because at first remember ruby they were talking about putting box fans in the room and that's like what they did and you're circulating the same air that's in the room around. So if somebody in there has COVID, you just gave it to everybody through the circulation of the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I told, you know, I told this reporter, I said, when, when, I open, when I open one window in my house and I want airflow, I have to open two windows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. you know? right. Like you have to open two windows mm-hmm. to, to create airflow. And so to have the ventilation system be based on opening one window to begin with doesn't make sense and then to put a box fan in there is that's your solution for not through the winter (laughs) you know like how do you justify purchasing all these box fans and thinking that you're doing a good job and then that's it so the pushback was now they, they're going to put air purifiers. They bought, I don't know how many, but the school department has now bought all these air purifiers that are going to the nurses, nurses' offices. And, and mind you, every school doesn't have a nurse. Right. And um, certain areas where people who might be positive will sit in. Mm. Really? It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, just it's all just, it's very sad because of the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can talk about how bad all these decisions are but at the end of the day you still have these students that desperately need in-person services that are still not receiving them mm. like since March mm-hmm. well, well he, before March really right before, right, well. before March so you know I think is, go ahead I just I feel like at this point you know with teachers and with parents kind of being pitted against each other the reality is but the school superintendent and the mayor, this is their plan. And their plan is not 
a real plan. Yeah. They haven't given us a real plan. And so, you know, their responsibility is also kind of, you know, folks are like, wow, you know, the union is suing, and, you know, parents are like, we need our in-person services, like, my child needs to be, you know, on the mat with other kids. You know, even right. layers of that are not happening because of the plan to have teachers do both in-person and online learning at the exact same time. Mm. And so, you know, you have this, this, this whole system-wide version of, of just, you know, bureaucracy that doesn't work. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, you still have children that aren't learning. Right, right. right. And in the middle of that, you know, on the wider, let's, let's look at the wider picture. It's happening in Boston, and we're in Boston, but across the country, there are teachers that are refusing to go back to the classroom, either because they have underlying conditions or they're being pushed out because the budget cuts, um, because, they, you know, the economy has been shut down. A lot of the school systems are funded by tax dollars, so tax dollars haven't been generated. Mm -hmm. And so the, the overall school system is being shortchanged. Again, in Boston, is no, never fully funded because the funding formula from the state wasn't correct. So around that same time that we were arguing about question two, many of us were going up there and testifying at the, at the Capitol, um, the State House saying, look, the way the Boston public schools are funded is putting our kids at a disadvantage, public schools at a disadvantage. Then you've got this knucklehead, DeVos, who's the Secretary of Education, who doesn't know her butt from a hole in the ground, who's basically destroying it. The federal dollars that were designated to help out the schools, she tried to divert to charter schools and public schools, and so people went to court to stop that from happening, but no money has come down. So mm -hmm. there are teachers that are being laid off. There are teachers that are not going back into the classroom because of their health. Mm -hmm. There are teachers that are walking away because they, they have kids, and they have elders, and they have people and families, and they don't feel safe going in there and coming back to their home and possibly bringing COVID, which has killed, at this point, 214,000 Americans. The United States is still the top of the heap in terms of killing its citizens. And then, you know, November 3rd, you still got people that are saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to vote. I don't know. Or they're voting for Trump. I'm going to name him, call him out there. Agent Orange and all the rest of his buffoons from the swamp, coming up at the swamp. And so people are saying, I don't want to necessarily vote for Trump. But it's not just Trump. It's um, federal courts. It's federal judges. Mm -hmm. It is um, DAs. It's state representatives. It's the whole system yep. that really yep. needs to dis be dismantled. And, and let's be clear, we're talking about a national security risk. And when I say that, if we are not educating our kids correctly, they cannot compete in the global economy. Yes, true. If we are not educating our kids, overall, American citizens, they can't afford to go to college or they're strapped with this debt that they can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. And they can't get the jobs that they need to be able to get the money that they need to support their families, which is the tax dollars that are going to the community. We are weakening, not us, but the economy itself is being weakening, weakened, and our black and brown kids, um, and now Ruby probably is, is more familiar with the numbers, but I remember her reading some percentages about how many kids are not even showing up now. Mm -hmm. On the, what was it? it was um, 3% or something? Only 3% of the kids are actually yeah. showing up? What was that, Ruby? Well, they, um, they released a report, Central Office, and they quietly just posted it on one of their websites. They didn't release it, you know, publicly or include it in any of the presentations of school committee. <clears throat> but it's essentially the attendance for, from March to, you know, June when people were online. And so the numbers are so bad because it shows how many, the percentage of students that logged in at least 80% of the time. And so if you logged in once at some point during the day, you're included in that 80% of the time. So it doesn't matter whether you stayed on the whole time. It doesn't matter if you just turned your computer on and walked away. It doesn't matter. You just logged on at some point, right? 80% of the time is you're looking at the percentages. But it gets increasingly worse as you get into the high school ages. So only 20% of special ed students 24% of English language learners and 18% of homeless students logged on at least 80% of the time. I mean, that's that's just embarrassing, you know? And then you get into, like, the different grade levels. And so in high school age, 
um, 6.8% of special ed students <coughs> logged in 80% of the time, 5.5 of English language learners, and 3.5 of homeless students logged into their online classes. That was it. 3.5. Mm, mm, mm. And you know, about some public schools. We're not talking about the suburban and suburban schools that have the money to be able to do these private pods and have private tutors. So you're, again, you're exacerbating the inequity because you've got the digital divide. So the schools were saying, school departments said, oh yeah, we send a, a Chromebook home with everybody. Well, guess what? If you have the parents that are home that are working online, you've got kids that are on, and everybody's online at the same time. Everybody can't get online at the right. same time. And right. so when the discussion with Comcast or the cable carriers came down, it's like, well, first off, how are they going to be able to afford being online? Mm. So the school says, well, we'll send Chromebooks home and we'll try to negotiate a low-level service. That mm. didn't work. It's still not working. Then somebody said free service, but it's still not addressing the low bandwidth for all these people to be online at the same time. And then the economy is trying to force parents, and let's face it, people that can't afford to not be in work are the ones that are being forced to go back to work. So you're talking about your poorest people. They're not the jobs there. And then the moratorium on rent and mortgage is about to end, what, today? Saturday. It was extended Saturday. by the governor today. So people have to go back to work to jobs that don't exist, making money that's not enough. And then the, and then the parents are saying, well, where am I going to put my kids? So you've got older kids who are only supposed to be going to school two days a week, taking the MBTA, which is not safe, going into schools that don't have the temperature checks, that don't have regular COVID testing, that don't have, you know, the, the security measures and the COVID safety measures that everybody else is, 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 is being mandated to have, and the schools are not doing it. So you're basically saying, well, you have to send your kids back, and then, you know, the occupant of the White House is saying, oh, we'll cut your funding. We'll cut your funding for the school, and we won't give you the money that wasn't enough to begin with. So it's it's a so you have the rich communities or the more affluent communities that tend to be predominantly white still being able to educate their kids in schools that were better anyway and that were better funded because they have higher taxes and higher property rates, which gives you higher taxes against Boston public school systems being thrown to the lions and basically their older siblings are trying to educate them or not because they're trying to keep up with their school. And then you still have the MCAS and all these exams in place that further shut our kids out from a quality education. So, um, I mean, it's just <coughs> dire straits. I think that, you know, there are schools in Boston that have majority affluent white families, and those schools are doing well, you know? And so I think in Boston in particular, you have, like, this huge step, well, not just in Boston, I think nationally, you have this huge separation of haves and have nots, and so the right. schools have haves and have nots, and so there are right. schools that we know that are affluent, that have wealthier families that are doing perfectly well with online and in-person learning. It is the schools that are not, <laughs> that are not affluent, that, you know, it's just kind of like, figure out what you're going to do, good luck with that, and that's, that's what mm. is even more disturbing about all of this is that it has further perpetuated this huge equity divide. And so, you know, at some point, we're still waiting for a comprehensive plan. So, like, I, you know, I, I, feel, I feel very conflicted because I, I love our teachers, I support our teachers, you know, and at the same time, I understand parents need those services. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's crazy for them to be asking for these services. And so you, you know, you create, right. And so the district has created this rock and hard place that parents, that teachers, that students have to choose. And, and that's not a good, that's not a healthy way to run a district. No. It's not a healthy way to run your education system, to like purposely pit these two parties against each other so that they can fight it out instead of being responsible and doing your job in terms of creating a plan, a comprehensive plan. And so when everything started in March, I started looking at what other cities were doing to see what plans were working. 
and we suggested some of these plans to district leaders. We talked to them about the Cambridge model, where they like you know did um, they they changed from their July presentation of the plan. They changed it to like go in in staggered levels, you know, and that's Cambridge's model. They started that. And then there's now the Framingham model, which I thought was particularly interesting. Basically, the Framingham superintendent went to their churches and they said, can you offer us space? And the Mm. church leader said, yes, but you need to bring your own staff and you bring your own cleaning stuff. You need to like bring your own food and you bring the teachers and you can use our space. And Mm -hmm. that's what they did. That's what they're doing. They have smaller spaces, smaller groups of children. Right, so it's more controlled. And then on top of that, like if one of those children, if you have a site, for example, with like 20 students, one of those children tests positive, that's 19 students, right? You're able to kind of like, okay, here's 19 kids that have been exposed. How do we mitigate this, you know, and keep it contained? Whereas the current model of DPS, you have one school with hybrid A, right? Let's say, for example, hybrid A has 20 students. Hybrid B has 20 students, and then hybrid C has 20 students. So you have 60 kids coming in and out of one space. If one of those kids tests positive for COVID, you have the potential of infecting 59 children versus 19. So, you know, these models we brought up to the district. We said, you know, explore this. Why aren't you doing this? Like, what about this? And so there's been plenty of communication with folks to the district that the district has not incorporated, has just said, thank you for your feedback. We really want to hear from you. And that's about it. It's just lip service. But they're not listening. When you talk, they're not listening. They haven't incorporated any of, like, creative thinking, creative problem solving, creative ideas. You know, we've been bringing up the fact that they have 35 schools that have HVAC systems. That doesn't necessarily mean that those HVAC systems are great ventilation systems, but they're at least functioning HVAC systems. Why don't you take those safest schools, the schools that have been identified with ventilation systems that work, put your highest need students in those schools, and then you have only 5,000 students to deal with, and you only have 35 schools to deal with. Right? And so you have more control over the possibility of, like, infection spreading, but you also have, you're meeting the needs of those in-person services in a safe environment that teachers feel safe going to. And so, you know, all these ideas we've shared and all these ideas have been, you know, accepted, but not implemented in any way, shape, or form. And then the other, the other thing is another of our, of our comrades who's not here, Edith Brazil, who's another, he's just a beast. Um, so her favorite, one of her favorite things, excuse me, is special education is a right, not a privilege. And so when people have IEPs, my daughter had an IEP, or a 504, these are legally enforceable documents that mandate that these students have a legal right to get all the supports they need to get a quality education. And if it, trust me, if this was Newton or one of these other, you know, Weston, there are parents that will show up with a lawyer to make sure that their kids get these services. And so when we're talking about special education, this is something these, that has been fought for that is legally enforceable in court. So it's not like, oh, yeah, that would be nice if we could do that for the, for the children who need it. No, it's, not, it's a right. It's a legal right. And so the school system in Boston has never, never met a good threshold for addressing those concerns for these young people, and those students tend to be more likely to go through the school-to-prison pipeline. Those are students who tend to be um, at a higher discipline rate. I was on a Zoom call yesterday um, about prison reform, uh, incarceration rates and prison reform. Black people in Massachusetts are eight times more likely to go to jail and be incarcerated. Eight times. That's crazy. Eight times. And we're not even that high a percentage. So when you're talking about the school-to-prison pipeline, this, you know, prison cells are built on the reading rates of third graders. So at Mm -hmm. third grade, if you're not reading up, if you're not at the the right level, they're already 
building itself where you're behind to go in there and work for free. Right. So Instead you know, of building more education name. centers, they're building more prisons, mm-hmm. which is... That's right. That's right. And so then that unbelievable. goes to the defund, de- defund the police and allocating services to more, mm-hmm. um, you know, actually social services, which actually support and make a society and a country stronger than tearing it down for the people that you don't care about, which is black and brown people and poor people. So I want to ask you a question. Did you know that Staples has partnered with BPS to help families with school supplies? By I giving saw that. You saw You know about that. So how many I saw that. How many families do you, black and brown families you know know about this? Um, I don't know. I mean, I know that uh, they've been, you know, I don't know how many people have accessed it. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And the school department hasn't shared those numbers either. So they do, they do actually announce that stuff at school committee meetings and things like that. But I think, you know, that's another layer of complication is that the district doesn't communicate effectively and well enough to get information out to families. They expect you to go to their website. They expect you to, like, look at their, you know, frequently asked questions. It isn't the other way around. Or if they mm-hmm. are communicating, they're sending it to, like, children's emails. So, like, right. the kids are getting the email updates and not the parents. And that doesn't so, make any kind of sense. You could no, at least send so, it to the parents and the student, not just send it to the student. Right. And but so I think day that's before, like the, Days before school is going to start, I was getting phone calls and looking at communication from teachers. It's like, so are we supposed to show up at the building or are we not? They're friends of mine who work in the cafeteria. And they're like, look, they had us in here. And one particular school, I won't name it, they, they call us in here three weeks before school is supposed to start. And because the cafeteria is closed with all this new equipment because all of the kids are going to be eating in their classroom, they had us down here and cleaning up and we see all these rat feces all over the place. So if you can't keep my feces, which carries disease and everything, out of here, mm. then what makes you think, what makes me think that you can keep COVID out of here? Are you kidding me right now? Mm-mm. So I agree with Ruby. Mm. I mean, I had a child that needed those services, and it was important for her to keep up. Mm. It wasn't even about advancing. It was like, can I be at the same level of my classmates? And I needed this, she needed the support, and I had to work. And so you want to be able to send your child to school and not get a gazillion phone calls during the day that your child dropped a pencil on the floor and it's an, on the floor and it's an infraction, or they're going to be kept for detention and suspension, because that has not... That over-policing of black and brown kids has not stopped. And it's actually even extended to Zoom. There have been stories across this country where teachers have seen stuff in a person's house and then called the cops. Mm. Or then because we're mandated reporters or called, you know, social services or whatever. So these are the complications that, that wow. you know, generationally we're going to see even further past this piece. But we've got to right. get over this piece because there is no vaccine. And even when it was mandated that all of the kids be vaccinated, there are people that are saying, I'm not taking that. And this was just a flu vaccine, not COVID. I'm not taking that. I'm not taking that. And as far as I know, and Ruby can correct me, I don't think that mandate was for the teachers, although as a, as a college professor, I did take all sorts of shots at Northeastern because we had international students, too. Mm. And that was a condition of employment. Mm. So I don't know, but I've yeah, heard people uh, talking. It, it? It's a mandate. They're supposed to, uh, for the students. So by, I think, December, the end of December, they're supposed to have their child vaccinated for the flu. And some families don't. I don't do that. I don't get the flu shot because I've gotten the flu shot before and then gotten really sick. So I just, you know, whatever reason, my body's really sensitive. Um, But, you know, and they, you know, for different rationale, like, families shouldn't be mandated to, like, get the flu shot for their child if if that's not, you know, their choice. But that's what's being... um, pushed right now um by by i believe the end of december they have to have gotten the flu shot right and so now i i usually get the flu shot because i do and uh, and I'm, I'm used to doing it from being an educator because basically and i love our kids but they're little germ carriers the younger they are the more germs that they have and so the, the symptoms of covid mimic the symptoms of a regular flu season which is what we're getting ready to go into so the powers of be said well let's eliminate that and mandate that everybody get the flu shot. But I, when I usually get a flu shot, what I was told from my hospital is that uh, hospitals are not, they don't really want you to go into the hospital, so they're using health centers and all these outlying centers, and you have to make an appointment 
to go in there and get a flu shot. I mean, you can also, I think you have to go to CVS and just get it. You can get yeah, the Walgreens, counter. someplace like that to get it. But the bottom line is they're they're trying they're man they're mandating the, the students to have flu shots, but the students aren't even in school. I mean, right. I I don't I clearly right. don't understand that mandate. Um, right. You know, it's 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 a major problem, and you know we definitely need to hold the school committee, uh, the school superintendent, and the mayor and our elected uh, city councils are accountable for this because. They had from March up until, you know, they knew school was going to start. They knew they weren't going to open school back up. So while school was closed, then that's when they should have been working on the plan so that when September came around that they would be prepared. But obviously they haven't been doing this. I, I, I don't know what, what they're doing. That's why there needs to be, like, major changes. However, because we're... We're in COVID. I mean, really, you know, every, everything's going to be blamed on COVID. And so how, how do we, you know, how do, how do we fight this? Um, what, what, you know, what, what do you think we should do? I also want to let you know that um, about the um, Staples stuff, bostonpublicschools.org slash Staples, if you're interested in getting supplies for your child or for your students. But I, I don't, you know, with this, this is, this is worse. It seems like it's worse now than it was back in March. So I, me not, me not being the educator, um, as far as in Boston public schools and stuff, what is going to happen? Do you all have any solutions? Um, what are you all trying to do? Are you trying to get folks to come, you know, people to get involved? Is there some place that you could go to sign up for these Zoom calls so that more parents will be? will be notified and know what's going on because it's going to take a massive lot of people to to make the, the you know really force their hand because right now it so seems like they're not listening a couple of things are going on black teachers matter we're putting together um ppe and health and wellness packages for black teachers and so i want to thank um bg um educated justice alliance bg my, my sister from another mister because you guys actually gave us um, food cards because I was hearing from teachers that there's food insecurity with some of the families that they are, whose kids they are teaching. And so the, as far as I remember, you know, during the shutdown, the schools made a way to bring food to families, but that hasn't continued on during the school um, session right now. There are meetings that are happening, um, school department meetings. You can go to the school department website and you can sign up to, to listen to that. In the next few, several days, there are going to be demonstrations and all these actions that the Boston Teachers Union is doing, so go to their website. Boston Education Justice Alliance, um, Beja, has um, information. SpedPAC has conferences and Zooms coming up. Beja has conferences and Zooms, so go to, I mean, everybody technically has access to the Internet. So some of these organizations, these organizations and some other organizations actually have information, but it is over overwhelming it's overwhelming and so look for the interest if you have a child with special needs or learning disability go to sped pack go to beige go to those places where you're interested there and there's a there's a lot of information a lot of meetings that are happening um black teachers matter is plugged into black curriculum culturally competent curriculums for indigenous and black um and native american people and people of color latina latinx and so we're doing that in terms of curriculum and supporting black teachers. I know Boston Education Justice Alliance is doing their piece too. Maybe. Yeah, we um, you know, we we hold we've been holding town halls around different issues of the reopening um, since since everything kind of shut down. Uh, but we our October ones are we're partnering with the Sped Pack. They're having several trainings on kind of like the the ins and outs of you know your special ed rights as a parent. Um, so I encourage folks to check those out, and you can connect to SpedPAC. Um, you can go to the bostonspedpack.org. That's their, their website, um, and sign up for their newsletters. I know they're having a training on, I believe, the 17th and the 29th um, around those different issues. Uh, and then Beja ourselves, you can connect with us at Boston Education. It's Boston, um, I'm sorry. I'm having a, a brain. Boston <laughs> Education <laughs> Justice Alliance. <laughs> I can't remember mm -hmm. my own website. 
sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's, um, I'm sorry. It's um, bostonedjustice.org. Um, <laughs> so you can connect with us and, you know, some of our, our campaign work. Usually we're, we do a lot of work around school budget advocacy because a lot of our school budgets have been cut so severely over the years. Um, and just trying to, to fight to get those, you know, funds replaced and increased uh, you know, over the over the past couple of years. So we're in the process of preparing for just another terrible battle to come because we know that our school mm. budgets are going to be cut because of enrollment. Um, and so, you know, we're preparing for that. We're, um, we usually, we have different meetings uh, for members. We have subcommittees working on different issues. Um, so we have a, a subcommittee that me and Sharon are a part of uh, that works on the state receivership or the, you know, the threat of state takeover, which is the, the memorandum of understanding that Sharon talked about earlier um, that was signed by uh, Dr. Caselius and Jeff Riley, the state commissioner, um, right before schools shut down. Um, so there's that. That's more longer term. And then we also just have a, a general, like, outreach and, and parent engagement uh, subcommittee as well that meets regularly. So the other thing know, is people need to fill out their census because um, your elected officials, the numbers of the census determines how many elected officials you will have representing you in various legislative bodies and vote. Don't just register. You need to register vote. and you need to register and vote. I, and oh, I highly encourage folks to, to connect in any way possible. Um, right. Even if you don't connect to our organizations, like look into your school leadership, make sure that you're going to your parent councils, to your school site councils. Um, right. You know, I think with Boston Public Schools, so much of all this policy is being in the weeds, and it's hard to understand, and it's, it's complicated. It's a lot. <laughs> but the more that you, like, kind of become entrenched in it, you realize how, how the devil is in the detail, and that is how we... And when I say we, I mean, you know, low-income people of color, those of us that are directly impacted by inequity in very direct ways, families that don't speak English, immigrant families, um, that is where we end up getting screwed over time and time again. And so I think, you know, parents really need to know what's happening in the weeds. And it's hard because it is so complicated, but it's important for them to at least know their rights to, like, know, you know, that they need to demand a translator in their meetings. You know, the school committee meetings are, are broadcast on uh, live, but at the same time, they only have ASL translation. So that's something okay, else we've Okay, I hate to do on. this to you, but we are out of time. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We will we'll definitely have to get you all back on because this information is very, you know, informative. Try to get you on at the 8 o'clock hour on the BG report. But I, I would definitely let, um, get in touch, keep in touch with you, Sharon, to find, you know, you'll be thank my you voice. Me. And thank, thank you, you for all. Thank you for having us, yes. Yes, thank you all. And keep up the fight. We're all in this together, for real, for real. In a little okay, bye-bye. Oh, and just like.